Hello everyone, today's game is between Alexei Shirov, 2745 at the time, with the white pieces, and Magnus Carlsen, 2770, with the black pieces. This game is from 2009, the 5th MTEL Masters Tournament, round 10. Shirov opened with E4, C5 from Magnus, Knight F3, Knight C6, D4, C takes D4, Knight takes D4, Knight of six, attacking the e-pawn, knight c3, e5, and now we have a Shreshnikov, d6, and bishop, g5, a6, knight e3, b5, and now bishop takes f6, and g takes f6. What can we say about this opening? What well, we will say, briefly, since uh, it has been played uh, recently uh, by Magnus, uh, after its um, popularity, I would say, in the uh, ni late 90s into the 2000s. Uh, what we will say about this opening is that black must play uh, in a dynamic uh, fashion. Like, if we were just going to briefly go over the highlights uh, in this position, we would say that black, uh, you know, has um, some space on the queen side, right? And he also has a lot of strong... Uh, points in white's position. What do I mean by the strong points? Well, positions where uh, white can't necessarily occupy uh, on in his uh, side of the territory if he wanted to. So, for instance, uh, ranks 1 through 4 and files A through H. So, this little square right here, this would be considered white's territory. And conversely, ranks 5 through 8 in files A through H, this would be considered black's territory. So strong points for black in white's territory would be squares like A4. Why is that? Because white could not safely occupy that square. C4 is another. D4 is another. F4 is another. G4 is another. So we can see that the price that black has paid for to occupy all of these uh, potential uh, or these weak spots in white's territory, right? To gain this space, the price that black has paid is he severely has, has severely compromised his pawn structure, which is a static disadvantage. So over the long haul, uh, that tends to to uh, favor uh, you know a, a end game for white in this particular position. Okay, so what does that tell us about the, the future planning of the position? Well, if we're black, that lets us know that, hey, I need, I need to use the advantage right now. The advantage that I can occupy my opponent's uh, weak, weak in squares as soon as possible. I need to exploit, right, these spaces. I need to exploit these open diagonals. I need to exploit these open files. Okay. I need to play as dynamic as possible and active. What does the activity do to your opponent? Well, it keeps them from focusing on the static weaknesses. Okay, so as long as you're um, putting threats and obstacles in front of your opponent, he can't concentrate on, say, winning a pawn, right? He can't concentrate on, um, you know, fortifying his grip on the D5 square, for example. Okay, so that's just one aspect uh, in this position. OK, uh, with that in mind, being that white uh, does have some strong points in the position and conversely weak points uh, for uh, black, black will at the same time be trying to mitigate uh, these weaknesses. So this is where you get the idea of F5 undermining the E4 E pawn, because once the E4 pawn is destroyed, it will weaken white's influence over the D5 square. Okay, so that's a uh, part of the strategy. Another uh, part of the strategy that we hit on is occupation and use of the G file. Okay, and that's why you see in this variation that black allows his pawns to be doubled. Okay, of course he can play uh, queen takes F6. There's nothing wrong with that. But after knight D5, he loses some time and his position isn't as dynamic. Of course, he's going to try to do the same things. Uh, play f5 to undermine the the e pawn etc but he doesn't have as much uh, many possibilities uh in the position this bishop 
takes f6, g takes f6 line, gives black a little more possibilities in the position. All right. Now you have an open G file. It's easy to develop this rook. And now you have two pawns to attack the E pawn with. You can use this pawn and then maybe later on you, you can use F5 also uh, to attack the center. All right. So there's a lot of um, options here. Another thing you want to notice too is black has his two bishops. So he wants to use all of these uh, factors uh, combined in order to play a very active uh, peace game against uh, white. All right. On the other hand, white is more or less trying to consolidate the position and exploit white's long-term positional uh, static weaknesses, mainly his pawns and mainly um, this hole on uh, d5, and also the weaknesses created around the king. So this is why you will see the queen come to h5 in a lot of variations. All right. So on one side of the board, black is playing dynamically, attacking, right, willing to sacrifice pawns. You definitely have to be willing to sacrifice pawns to um, push forward your overall objective. All right. If you're scared to sacrifice pawns to beat down material, this is not the opening to play uh, for you is black. OK, so what do I always say about pawns? You have to keep them mobile, okay, at all costs, especially in this position with black. All right, we already said that his pawn structure is a static weakness, so if they can get fixed and blockaded, um, they're just sitting ducks. All right, so black definitely must keep his pawns mobile at all costs. So this is um, some of the um, ingredients that make for a great fight in the position over the chessboard. Uh, and this is one of the... Uh, greatest openings uh, for black because it gives black a fighting chance all right it's like the Dutch defense right a lot of imbalances created over the board but you have a chance okay so let's go now and see how these ideas work out so after G takes f6 we see knight d5 right natural occupying a uh, major weakness in the black uh, center now Bishop g5 Okay. Bishop d3. And now knight e7. And we can see already black is uh, working on getting, attacking d5. Right? It's important. Right? He wants to get rid of that strong piece that's just sitting there comfortably in this territory. Another option, of course, is bishop e6 or just simply castling. Knight e7. Knight takes e7. Queen takes e7. All right. What happens sometimes if black, if white um, allows knight takes d5 is that the focus of the game kind of shifts a little bit. So, um, I don't know. Let's just make a move here. Like castle and then black gets to play knight d5. E takes d5. What you get is this battle of majorities now. Okay, the game takes on a more positional um, light. And that now you have white with this four to three majority on the queen side, which he often tries to push. And there's many games like that. And then you'll get black. Um, sorry about that. You'll get black um, on the king side, conversely, uh, trying to attack over there, a la uh, King's Indian defense. I actually like this position a little bit better for black. So knight takes e7. He's usually play queen takes e7 and now we see the attack here and of course if black plays a move like b4 this kind of helps white out a little bit here not only does he attack and get to move his knight with tempi over here to e3 right by attacking this pawn he also puts more pressure on the d5 square and makes it harder uh, to advance The other alternative is just to ignore the pawn, but then, of course, he would be uh, down uh, material. All right, so this is a situation where uh, black doesn't really want to advance, right? And black uh, doesn't want to capture. So this explains the next move by Magnus F5 because he's trying to undermine the white center at all costs. All right, 
So he just plays f5. In this case, if c takes b5, notice that this pawn right here is helping restrain d5. So if c takes d c takes b5, this frees up this pawn now to advance d5. And you can see now white is faced with the dilemma whereby let's say if he captures here then e4 comes and now again you have what i was talking about earlier in the mobile center okay the mo excuse me the mobile pawns of black all right the pawns must be kept moving at all costs even though he's down material black has excellent uh, compensation here this bishop has come alive now on this diagonal uh and it's going to be very uh difficult uh for white uh, to be able to um, hold on uh, to his material advantage uh, for long. His black just becomes too dynamic in the position here. So for example, castles, bishop takes b2, double attack on the knight, rook is being attacked, so let's say knight c2, and black can either take this rook right here if he wants, or he can just castle and um, you know play like that most players will probably just snatch the uh the rook here so after c4 f5 shirov castle maintaining the tension in this position castles and now queen h5 another move we spoke about earlier and now rook b8 again Magnus does not want to uh, do anything with those pawns over there on the uh, queen side. So e takes f5, e4. Remember, the willingness to sacrifice pawns to keep the uh, mobility in the position. Now, rook a e1, exploiting the pin. Bishop b7. All right. So now you have two attackers, two defenders on the e-pawn. Queen drops back to g4. All right, so now you have a third attacker on the e-pawn, and then in some lines you have ideas of even this move f6 being played. Magnus plays rook f8, defending the e-pawn. So now you have uh, three attackers, three defenders on the e-pawn. And now finally, Shirov decides to play this move. C takes uh, b5, and Magnus has the same idea. He's not thirsty to capture this pawn. Instead, he just mobilizes his center. D5. So now he has four um, defenders uh, uh, on the e, e pawn, and I just want to make a note and um, just take a second and talk about Nemtsevich's principle of overprotection really quick. And basically, what he said is, when you have one attacker and one defender, okay, defense is tied up. Okay, if you have two attackers, two defenders. Defense is tied up. Why? It's because if you move, remove one of the defenders, then then the pawn or whatever's being attacked will fall. So, as long as you have an even amount of defenders, even amount of attackers, the defense is totally uh, tied up in defense, right? So, three attackers, three defenders, defense is tied up. Now, if you have three attackers, like we have in this example, but now you have four defenders, now all four defenders are free in other words you can move any of those pieces now and the pawn in this case the e4 pawn will still be protected that's how strong that move d5 was because by over protecting the e4 pawn now now black's pieces that were once tied down to the defense they can all move so now this queen is no longer tied to protecting e4 the rook is no longer tied up the bishop is no longer tied up okay because the pawn has just one extra defender. That is the principle of overprotection in a nutshell. B takes a6 and B and bishop c6. Now, what was the price that, again, for all of this mobility and activity and now dominance in the center that black had to pay? Well, he's down uh, three pawns, right, if I'm counting correctly. All right, he's down three pawns, but let me say that uh, he has full compensation here. Right or close or pretty much close to it. All right. So, but he has to play accurately, and so does so does White. But being now material, all right, maybe there's a little bit more pressure 
to make uh, more correct moves. So bishop c6, why does he play bishop c6? Um, bishop a8 would be a move that you would want to play because then you don't have to worry about maybe this pawn trying to queen or sacrifice itself on a8 in the future is like already blockaded and the bishop is still doing his job but the problem with that is then bishop b5 kind of disrupts the coordination a little bit of the pieces so magnus says hey i'll just play bishop c6 now this pawn is under attack so shirov plays b3 cool now king h8 is played the reason is is because Magnus wants to grab this knight here, but the problem is, is f6 will win for uh, white. Okay, this this bishop is pinned, and after queen f8, he doesn't even have to capture right away. He can play another move like bishop e2, right? Protect his bishop real quick, and then, you know, snatch the uh, bishop up. So, Magnus plays king h8 first. Now, another point I want to make. And it's a point I've made in other videos. Lasker once had remarked that when having to make a defensive move, always try to make like a double-edged defensive move, meaning a move that contains some poison in it. So a defensive move, but with some offense attached to it. All right. So this is where setting traps and things like that uh, come into play. So instead of just playing King H8, which is a good move, right? It avoids it, the pin and all of that. And you, you now you're threatening to snatch, snatch the um, you're threatening to snatch the uh, the knight. All right, sorry about that. I got interrupted, man. Somebody came to the to, to the door. All right, so let's see where were we. Okay, so we're talking about this uh, idea of making like aggressive defensive moves if you have you know have the chance to make them. So in this case, again, it's hard to knock a move like King H8. There's clear ideas here of not only um not not only just moving the king passively out of the way you know to avoid stuff like f6 you know wanting to threaten the knight but also in black's plan is to play rook g8 and it all ties in remember how i was saying that now the pieces are free from the responsibility of e4 just by putting this extra uh defender there now this rook can move here to the open g file which we analyzed early at the beginning of this recording as something that could possibly uh be useful to black so this move king h king h8 has all of those elements in mind however there's a stronger move here uh for black the move is just h5 and the reason why h5 is so strong is because not only it attacks the queen um <clears throat> but indirectly attacks the knight also because if queen takes h5 now this idea of f6 is out of the window and then black can just simply play queen uh, queen takes h3 so it's h5 queen takes h5 then just sim simply queen takes h3 So therefore, queen g3 to stay online, and then you just do h4 again. And then let's say if queen g4, then now this bishop can come to d7, which again kind of throws a little monkey wrench here. Gives white something to think about as uh, far as playing um, f6 is in concern. So knight b1, and this is just a sample line. Queen f6, and now... You know, of course, this is legitimately threatened. Bishop e2, and there you go. Bishop takes f5. Notice how black isn't actively trying to gain material back, but just due to his dynamic activity and pressure in the position, the material just seems to kind of fall uh, into his hands. All right, so h5. We're not saying that's the best move, but definitely a uh, alternative uh, in the position. But... I can't knock King H8 too hard, all right, because it is logical. So King H8, the knight is actually threatened, so knight comes to C2. Magnus plays Bishop E5, continuing along with this plan to bring the rooks to the open G file and attack the king, all right. Um, of course, the bishop again is now legitimately attacked, so Bishop E2, and now uh, Magnus played d4. Now, when I looked at this game originally, 
I I like to play Rook G8 first. Usually, the way I look at these type of things is, um, and of course, I'm not a grandmaster, so I can't, you know, I'm not, believe me, I'm not knocking Magnus, but I like to play moves that are, like, obvious first, that I know that I want to play first, and then I'll play, like, a move that's more committal, especially when it comes to pawn moves. So, for instance, Rook G8, when after I played Bishop E5 or whatever, I know I'm setting up to play Rook G8. I know I want my Rooks on the G file, okay, at this point. So, without blinking your eye, I'm playing Rook G8 first, all right? And then see what White's reaction is uh, from there, okay? Here, Magnus played the move D4. Um, again, his pawns are mobile in the center, gain more space, all right? And also, he's some lines, uh, some has some ideas of opening up this line uh, for this bishop, right? Eventually, so again, it's logical, all right. However, once you make a pawn move, you can't take it back. And anytime you put your pawn forward, you're always leaving some kind of weakness somewhere. In this case, notice right here how d4. The, the D pawn was covering the C4 square. Once he once he commits, now this now this bishop immediately improves itself. Bishop C4, and that's why you have to be careful with the pawn moves, especially because you can't take them back. With the Rook G8, you know you want to go there, and there's no you know really no downside to playing that move, right? And you get more information out of your opponent because now you get to see his reaction. Is he going to go to h3? Is he going to go to h5? You get to see, you know, he might just blunder here. Okay? At the d4, you don't get to see the reaction uh, right away. And now this piece improves itself drastically with bishop c4. Now rook g8 comes. And now queen h3. My contention is we've we could have gotten that information by playing rook g8 here then he would have did that okay and now maybe you don't play d4 uh at least yet you know maybe you play something else maybe you just um you know try to move your your rook double your rooks first or something like that anyway bishop e2 d4 bishop c4 rook g8 Queen h3, rook g7, right, following the plan, g3, anticipating the attack down the g file, but nevertheless weakening the king side, rook b g8 by Carlson, and now, good strong move by Alexei Shirov here, showing his class, he plays queen h6, remember, defense mixed with offense, right, what is, what is he doing, well, he's, He's defending. He's defending against the the attack against this uh, G pawn, okay? Because one of one of the ideas in this position is that Black wants to play uh, Queen D6 and pile up on this G pawn. Um, some lines even sacrificing at some point. Maybe, for example, after playing a move like uh, you know another sacrificial move like uh, E3. Right, weakening the F2 square and then sacrificing wholesale here with the bishop, rook, etc., etc. Right, leading to some type of mating attack. All right, so Shirov seeing all of that, he plays the move queen h6. First of all, it stops this move like in this track, so there will be no queen d6. Second, it attacks the point, the hanging piece. And remember, we were speaking about this piece earlier how. Black would have preferred to just have it on C8 already, so that in case later on in the game, um, you know, White wouldn't be able to just say sacrifice this pawn and, and force a piece to be distracted away or something like that, or decoyed away in some lines. So we see Bishop C6 kind of coming back to haunt Black, although Black had to play it then because we had to prevent Bishop B5 from harassing the Rook, but now the Bishop is just hanging there. So here is a perfect time for black to kind of reassess things and play this move um bishop to c7 excuse me bishop to a8 however carlson had the right frame of mind in thinking uh, 
your best defense is a good offense, right? He had he had the right frame of mind, and so he played queen c7. So hey, I can't get my queen to d6, but I'll just go to c7, doing the same thing, right? This guy's protected, and I'm still doing what I want to do. So he had that Lasker mentality, like hey, I'm gonna defend, but I'm gonna be threatening you at the same time, all right? However. There's a tactical flaw here, and this is why the move Bishop A8 had to be played. Can you see it on the board? All right. Well, Shirov found a very simple move here. And it is known in chess as a double attack. He just simply played knight to b4. Knight is attacking the bishop. Queen is attacking the bishop. That leads to a loss of time. So now, Bishop A8 is forced and right from there, knight d5, attack continues, gains time, queen d8 from Magnus, and now Shirov played the simple rook takes e4, and on move 30, Magnus Carlsen had to resign, alright, this is a real uh, simple, let me save my analysis here, this is a real simple uh, ending right here, if bishop takes of course then just simply rook takes e5 okay if you want to continue and um black doesn't have anything um you know to look forward to the other possibility is f6 guess what if f6 Rook takes e5 again, <laughs> and after f takes e5, then uh, knight f6 is just hard to deal with, right? You have the double attack here, and um, let's say the rook f8, knight h5, and then you got f6 coming. And this actually almost forces black to get, you know, to uh, play queen g5, and of course you can just see what's happening and that's all she wrote so a uh, very interesting game I hope you um, you know learn something from that fantastic game uh, by Mr. Fire on board himself Alexei Shirov who was a fantastic player in the 90s um, you know of course Kasparov was his nemesis but um, man great player um, Matter of fact, check out my video on the, uh, I'll, I'll post a link uh, below, matter of fact, uh, uh, on the Shirov-Kramnik match in 1998, I believe. Yeah, 1998, because the, the winner of that match was supposed to play um, Gary Kasparov for the World Chess Championship. And as you know, uh, looking back, you know, in history, Kramnik was the one to finally dethrone uh, Kasparov, you know, with the uh, famous uh, use of the Berlin defense during that Brain Games uh, match uh, in the early 2000s. But uh, Shirov was actually um, on paper supposed to be the challenger of, to uh, Gary Kasparov because he had faced uh, Vladimir Kramnik in the match to determine that challenger and defeated uh, Kramnik in the match. And then a lot of uh, politics, uh, you know, came into play and eventually Kramnik was chosen. But uh, I'll post that, that video where I explain the background and, you know, I go through the match, but it also, you know, gives you the story behind uh, the scenes, what was going on also. But um, that is it for this video. Like, if we're going to conclude what lessons we learned from this video today... It's, um, if you're playing opening like the stretch in the call with black, you have to be dynamic, right? Pawn mobility at all costs, okay? Never let your pawns get fixed or immobile. You must be willing uh, to sacrifice material, okay? And um, if you're playing with the white pieces, you want to, um, you know, try to consolidate um, um, and pinpoint black static weaknesses, like for instance, the D5 square, his weak pawns, okay and just slowly um and methodically grind down and definitely be on the lookout uh, for tactical blows all right so that is it for this video please like subscribe uh check the links below please 
uh, support my channel please uh, donate um, also there's DVDs and or books uh, always related to the opening that we see presented on the board today in this case it's the Sicilian Shreshnikov so enjoy and I'll see you guys on the next video